Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Unity of New Westminster's Sunday Celebration Service. Please join us for our opening song this morning, This Land is Your Land. This land is your land, this land is my land, from Mona Vista to the Vancouver Island. From the Arctic Circle to the Great Lake Waters, this land was made for you and me. As I went walking that ribbon of highway, I saw above me that endless skyway. I saw below me that golden valley. This land was made for you and me. This land is your land, this land is my land, from Bona Vista to the Vancouver Island, from the Arctic Circle to the Great Lake Water. This land was made for you and me. When the sun came shining and I was strolling and the wheat fields waving and the dust clouds rolling as the fog was lifting. My voice was chanting, saying, This land was made for you and me. Welcome back. I am Reverend Rona Segura, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our Sunday celebration service at Unity of New Westminster in beautiful British Columbia, Canada. Whether you are watching us live on Zoom or on Facebook or on YouTube, or whether you are finding us on demand after the service, it is my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of all of us here. We would love to stay connected with you. So please subscribe to our newsletter on our website or subscribe to our YouTube channel or join our Facebook group. And that way you will be notified anytime we have a service. We are so glad that you are part of our experience today. The Unity Movement offers ideas for full and abundant living. We draw on the teachings of Jesus, who we consider our primary way shower and example. And we honor that there is wisdom in faith traditions all over the world. We respect every person's right to choose their own spiritual path, their own life path. All are welcome here. All are worthy here. All are celebrated here. We open our service today in prayer. I gratefully acknowledge that I speak to you on the traditional and unceded territory of the Semiamu First Nation. And we give thanks to First Nation peoples everywhere for their custody of this beautiful land. 
We give thanks that we are able to meet together in this virtual setting at a time when we are unable to meet in person. We give thanks for our connection one with each other. That connection that happens whether we are in each other's physical presence or not. The connection that binds us all together. We acknowledge that there is only one presence, that there is only one power, that power that is understood by many names, many faces, and many paths. And we affirm that regardless of the name, the face, or the path of our understanding, that we are one human family. And it is in that knowledge of our oneness that we send a blessing for love, for peace, for contentment to every being on this planet, to every being, regardless of all the labels that threaten to divide us. We are one. And for this knowledge, for this intention, and for the power that we have to bless, we give thanks. Amen. One of my favorite picnic places to go to is the historic Stewart Farm in Surrey. One sits facing north and looks at a river, the Nicomechel River going by, and then some fields with corn, I believe, and then the mountains are in the distance, and it's quite beautiful. And one evening I was sitting there waiting for Walt to arrive with supper, and noticed that to my right there was a family, it looks like a couple of families, who were speaking a language I didn't understand and recognize, who were of European descent. And then to my left was another group of people, multiple races, but largely what looked like from Indian descent, the two adorable little girls running around. And then further in front of me was another group of people that looked like they may have been of um, Chinese descent. And directly in front of me was a group of women who were from Eritrea, I lately, later discovered. They were speaking their language, and they were of the Muslim faith, wearing their hijabs and sitting and enjoying a lovely evening picnic. And they started laughing about something. Now, I don't know what was said, but their laughter was so infectious that it drew my attention, and I started to smile and laugh as well that reaction drew their attention and they came over and invited me to partake of some of their meal. It was beautiful. It was just this amazing moment of humanity connecting with humanity despite our differences that we look like on the outside and the languages we speak and the people that we worship, the gods that we worship. And as I was chatting with this lady who had come to invite me to, to share in their table, she said 
the same thing that I had noticed. Look around. Wow, isn't this amazing? This is Canada. Look. Where in the world could we possibly have this many nations, this many languages, all living together in peace? Isn't it beautiful? And it was. And that is what we think of when we think of Canada. It is what we like to think of when we think of Canada and what Canada represents. And we've always sort of rested in that comfortable assurance that that is what Canada is. And it is only just recently that with painful discovery we have come to recognize that there is another side to Canada that we didn't appreciate, that we didn't understand, that we weren't willing to recognize. And that is the way that the indigenous peoples of our country have been treated. Right up until 1996 when the first, when the last residential school closed, we have treated our immigrant population with all of that excitement at the variety that they bring. And yet we haven't embraced our own First Nations culture, our own First Nations gifts, our own First Nations spirituality. Instead, we've sidelined it. We've chosen not to listen. We've chosen not to hear. And now the time has come for us to change that, to look the truth in the eye and accept that wrongs have been perpetrated on the children and the families and the grandparents of those of our country who are indigenous. Today's service is not going to be a normal Canada Day celebration service. Instead, we are going to look at some of these aspects of Canada. And the way we're going to do that is to drop in on a discussion that Aaron and Lyle and I had on Wednesday, earlier this week, when we had a, a meeting to discuss forming a team to look at how to improve our education awareness and meaningful support of the indigenous population. And Lyle has very generously agreed to lead our team in this endeavor. And what I expected to be a planning meeting ended up being a profoundly educational and insightful discussion. And by luck, I was recording it. And so some of it we intended to record as a message to the congregation, and you'll see that. And some of it was just part of our discussion. And so today's service is not going to be sort of a traditional Rona stands up and tell you stuff. It's going to be these snippets of information and our conversation. And I do hope that you enjoy listening to the wisdom as well as the excitement and passion for Canada that we all share, as well as the ideas that we have so that we can move forward accepting what has been and committing to inclusion, understanding, truth, and reconciliation. You'll find 
because I was not expecting to be to, to have this conversation in such a profound way. The lighting is not good, the sound may not be great, the words are magic. One of the discussions we had was about the singing of O Canada. I wanted to sing O Canada because it is one of my favorite things to do on Canada Day. And the discussion revolved around the idea of singing O Canada as a prayer. And then Aaron reminded me that Indigenous people leadership have asked that this year, for one year only, that we refrain from the singing of O Canada in honor of the children who have passed away and in honor of the families who have all been affected so much by the residential school system. And so you'll hear a discussion about the singing of O Canada and my invitation to you is to think of the words as a prayer. A lot of people are, are choosing not to do the celebrating and find ways to celebrate Canada at this moment in time. But I think just for this one year, like Aaron said, maybe it is probably not a good idea. But I do, I still kind of like the idea that you presenting the idea of looking at the words and seeing what it really means are we fulfilling those those words when it comes to indigenous people are they included maybe not playing the song but i like the idea of exploring that and especially for the individual who isn't indi indigenous does that song really ring true to you now at this point and does it does it give you a call to action instead you know, do you, does it, is it something that's going to say to you, are they glorious and free? They're not really glorious and free at the moment, as everybody would think. I don't know. It's just my thoughts. But I, I have to agree with Aaron on the thing. I probably it isn't a good idea right now, not this year. And to explore the words. Like, even this discussion yeah. is really rich. Yeah. Again, explore what, it, what you're singing. It's like singing the Lord's Prayer or singing like all those yeah, because, things, right? That we just sing them. Yeah, because when we sing things, when we sing a song, we're actually sending out the actual thoughts out. We're creating. And so what are the what is the creation that we're putting behind the word? What is the it that you're sending out there? So are you thinking of 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 a glorious and free? people for everybody that including the indigenous people as you're singing that because if you are then you're actually doing a little bit of reconciliation in a sense maybe not everybody can see it but if you were thinking about indigenous people at the time that you know this has to ring true to them and i'm thinking about them right now that might be something there yeah More Indigenous people are in jail now than, than non-Indigenous people. More yeah. kids are in foster care than have ever been, than were ever in the residential school system. More Indigenous kids. And so it's that thing where, you know, it represents, it's what, like 3% of, of, of Canadian culture, Canadian society are Indigenous people. And yet the... Oh. The number of high school dropouts, the number of kids in care, the number of people in jail are all like over, over, over represented in all of those things. Yeah, I did a play once actually with a company called uh, Azimuth Theatre and we traveled uh, across Canada presenting a play called uh, Maelstrom and the, the actual uh, play was about four men who were abusive to in different ways. And so they re they were taking it to jails. And so I went to the Masque Mas prison, uh, you name it, all the jails here, Williams, or the uh, the one in Victor or Victoria, everywhere, all across Canada. And 
they decided to, it didn't have an indigenous character in it, but they, they realized they needed to write one in. So they did under Lauren Cardinal, who is my cousin, wrote his part or the part of that I played in the, the production. And uh, the reason for that was because of the high population of indigenous inmates that were represented and they wanted to touch those areas. It was amazing because they would talk to us afterwards and the stuff that they would talk about and everything was just, uh, it was just amazing. I, I had such an experience with that. But it, I did see the, the populations of Indigenous people and I couldn't, for the life of me, figure out why there were so many Native people in jails, especially in, I think it's in Manitoba. Uh, I can't remember the one that's there that I went to. It's a great big institution and they were, it was so full of Indigenous people. I was, why? I just kept asking why, why? They have done something wrong that requires them to go to jail. And then there's lots of evidence that if a white person did that, they wouldn't go to jail. Yeah. And but the there's and so then they end up in the jail and it's just a kid who just did something wrong. And then the next thing you know, they're in a gang. And then the next thing you know, if they leave the gang, they'll get they'll get killed. Right? They'll right. was one thing that always came up when it were, people were talking about the churches and the churches offering their apologies, the ones that were involved. And I always say it always just seems like words mostly when they say it, because the actions, I think, are, would be more important as to what kind of action they take. And, and so I went back to that and I thought, well, the, if the churches that were involved set up, like the Catholic Church, for example, there are 14 million of them in Canada. If they just took the one dollar, one dollar each from each person, they reached in their pocket pool that one loony, that's $14 million they could give to um, an organization to help with the um, with the healing process of, of different individuals, whatever it may be. So that's why I'm thinking if we were to do something where it was um, a direct uh, um, blow to he or helping out with the uh, healing of our people, it might look totally different to a lot of people uh, our church may look a lot different to a lot of people the word church itself might look different to them because the word church itself does bring a lot of animosity for a lot of indigenous people God gave some kind of blessing He said something about sins that needed confessing There was no time for kisses, no time for goodbyes He had the Lord on his lips, but the devil in his eyes Took away our clothes and our Indian names They pulled out my feather and threw it to the flames They cut off the braids that my mama had tied It had the Lord on their lips But the devil in their eyes When I think I ache when I ache, I drink When I drink, I fly high above the mute Somewhere outside my head And I fly till I sleep And I sleep till I dream And I dream till I wake And start thinking again I miss my mama and I miss my dad And I thought I'd run in each chance that I had But they beat us like dogs every time we got caught They had the Lord on their lips 
with the devil in their hearts. And sometimes at night the wolves would appear, and I'd face the wall hoping no one would hear. I never said nothing. The shame was too much. He had the Lord on his lips. The devil in his touch, and I lost my stories, and I lost my songs, I lost my ways and my Indian tongue. And how could a man of God do what he did? We were just children, Christ. We were just kids. When I think, I ache. When I ache, I drink. When I drink, I fly high above the butte, somewhere outside my head. And I fly till I sleep, and I sleep till I dream, and I dream till I wake and start thinking again. Again, again. Hi everybody. Um, I'm. I'll just get started here. So, so Rona and I have been talking to Lyle uh, about some of the things that we've been doing at Unity of New Westminster in terms of the Truth and Reconciliation documents and the calls to action and the 250 ch 15 children and the growing number of those kids and and just how we can kind of move forward as a small local church. So Lyle, you had lots of lots of thoughts, um, and uh, and those are starting to take shape. Can okay, I I would like to start by uh, encouraging people to become a part of a, a healthy change or healthy growth with us when it comes to learning about indigenous peoples. Well, the idea came from Rona that we have a labyrinth out front. And Cliff took the idea on and started to develop one. And he thought of the idea of using a medicine wheel in it somehow. So he started trying to design one. And we found a book that talks about using the wheel itself as a healing sort of venue for trying to progress oneself, not just spiritually, but as an individual. So the whole idea of having a medicine wheel underneath the main foundations of a labyrinth, which is walkable. And you can walk through the medicine wheel and observe the many different parts of it and learn about it and your position in the wheel itself while you are thinking and observing. You may not think of the medicine wheel as you're going through it. You may just think about the actual meditation of walking through a labyrinth, but making it available to you there while you're going through it is something that would be probably beneficial to all people. So, we're going to come up with a, a committee of people that want to help out, to come up with ideas, and we're only starting from the beginning here, so it's not set in stone. And we will come up with something so brilliant that maybe it would be something that we be so proud of that we can share with other people, and it will be shareable. And so I encourage you to join with me and help develop a, a labyrinth medicine wheel fusion, so to say, that we can incorporate it into our church and have it there to say we acknowledge the indigenous people and some of their ways alongside our own and we'll see like i said before we'll find together that we have very many things in common in our unity of church that we do with the spiritual nature that comes from the creator himself as well too the creator allah god whatever term you want to use we're all from the same energy source so let's incorporate that and we'll find out some really beautiful things. 
We certainly will. We certainly will. Wow. I feel like letting it in some cement now. <laughs> Get that labyrinth started. <laughs> and that was that was one idea and that we had some other ideas and um, and uh, Rona's been doing a great job of the territorial acknowledgement and and that's a thing that we could talk more about and have some other folks in, some elders maybe, to talk about how they see our us being connected. We've been tithing to at least two organizations uh, that support children and adults and uh, rehoming people. So uh, the Spirit of the Children Society just did some brilliant work around um, moving people out of tent cities and into homes. Um, and so we've been tithing to them regularly as we can. <clears throat> Rona, there was a big, there was a big uh, a prayer, a unity prayer that I know Greta went to, uh, a meditation for all of the children that are being found. And that was, I think, right across Canada. Mm -hmm. There were, that was so well attended, they actually maxed out. They expected, uh, they expected fewer than 100 people to show show up for that prayer vigil and they ended up at capacity and had to essentially not allow some people in because their zoom account only allowed 100 attendees so i think that speaks to the commitment of people within unity to understand more to take whatever action we we can add value with and, and and so it's this mix of understanding what the truth is and in many cases people who are non-indigenous have absolutely no idea that this was even part of what was going on in our in our country i mean you hear things like babies in unmarked graves and you think this doesn't happen in canada and so there's a level of of shifting of our own trust, I think, of what our understanding of the country is. And then to, to understand more about what we didn't know, and then an understanding of what can we do that can support healing and move together with Indigenous people into... Um, into a new, a new fusion, if you will, a new relationship that includes includes some of the cultural teachings and some of the richness of the culture. And if I think about, you know, Canada prides itself on being inclusive and diversity and all that stuff. And right in our own backyard, we weren't practicing it. And so, how do we? How do we shift that? And how do we do it with the people who are the founding? Um, you know, we say our home and native land. Well, it's our home and natives land. I've, I always sing it that way. Um, how, do we, how do we acknowledge that and come to terms with where we are? So. Our would be, uh, Rona has talked to me about the seven sacred teachings and asked me to do a talk on that. And I think that's a good place because it's very universal and people find that they connect with those words and the, the, because there's seven basic teachings about truth, honesty, humility, and so on that are so important and universal that you'll find that it probably fill, fits in with unity quite well. And we're not so far off from knowing the same truths as well too. So if we can do that, we're going to incorporate a few things like that. I think it would be a good starting place. I love that idea, Lyle. I am to to recognize that that spiritual teachings and wisdom are universal and to be able to to incorporate the wisdom of other cultures is ex especially the ones that are in our own country is exactly the point you know we mm -hmm. talk about all people being all welcome and all worthy and these are universal spiritual universal not just spiritual teachings but universal life teachings which mm -hmm. is the same thing right everything mm -hmm. is spiritual yeah. 
So, so we have a few ideas and collect the history. Lyle is going to give a talk about the seven sacred teachings, which we're all looking forward to. Um, and uh, Lyle is the new chairperson of, of our indigenization committee or whatever we're going to call it. So he's looking for some help. Um, and uh, that would be great if you have either information or willingness, uh, get in contact with him. And, um, and then I think I would, one of the things we've been talking about a bit is um, having a showing of the film, which is called A Tribe of One, which is about the, the Kakite people who lived here in New Westminster and the history of them. And so we'll have a film and, and a little discussion group. Um, so we've got a few plans that I'm really excited about. Uh, it's an experience that I had at the park. It was beautiful. A uh, bunch of Muslim women sitting here um, and speaking in their language and, and just having a wonderful experience. Another European group over here speaking in a different language and someone over here and who were uh, from, I don't know what country, uh, but playing over here and then, you know, there was people from everywhere. It was like this multicultural miracle. And, and I was sitting watching all of this at a picnic table and the women started laughing. They were laughing about something and it was so infectious that I started to laugh. And then they noticed that I started to laugh then they came over and offered me food and coffee and we just ended up having this like oh this is brilliant anyway so then we started talking about she this this one woman was like this is what canada is and so there's this part of what canada is is this and what canada also is is this dark underbelly that we didn't know about or that some of us knew about but no one would listen to or some of us knew about but were never heard and so it's time for it's time to look at the underbelly and bring it to the light anyway. and i think that's the thing i think that's the thing that um we, we always look at Canada, some people will say that why don't, when they come to our country, why don't they learn our customs and traditions? But that's not really the Canada that is really there that has been there since the beginning. Because if we look at it through Indigenous eyes, we have adapted to other cultures that have come here. That was the beginning of Canada. The Indigenous people adapting to other cultures. So that in a sense is a Canadian way because that's bringing in the other cultures that, and learning from them and adapting them for our use and our need for what's necessary in today's society. So that's the Canada I look at, is that these cultures that come into this country, we learn from them and adapt them to bring to our cultures, to make it, to enhance us, to make us more than we were before. And that's what this is all about. I, I wanna uh, explore more about that idea of, taking the best of other cultures to make ourselves better and and I think that's happened effectively for people from other countries coming in but yeah. it hasn't been effective about the people who are our first nations yeah. the, the first people of our country I think it probably it, it's probably a situation where it it may not look that we've we're gaining something from the other cultures that are coming in but in some ways we actually are we've we have a we've grown accustomed to a certain way of living and we don't always get those things like clean running water for some reserves and whatnot but we do get the benefits of a, a rich society the ability to go from one place to another to a fusion fest where you meet people and different foods and different ideas and different thoughts and incorporate them and we are like that even the term bannock is scottish and we've taken that as an indigenous people and we've incorporated it into our culture and it has enhanced us because it made us be, be identified with 
Bannock making in all different forms because Bannock isn't necessarily only made one way. It's made different ways in this country. So that's the, that's the benefit is that we can take what we've learned and we can adapt it to what makes us a better people. And we enjoy those things. We enjoy Bannock. <laughs> we enjoy the foods that come in from other countries because we wouldn't have experienced them any other way unless people came here and said, this is what I eat. This is our food. This is our customs. So we learn those things and we learn how to be on the international scene as well too. So some of us as Indigenous people travel the world and they that wouldn't have been done without the experience of meeting people from other places. So adaptation is one of the most important things that, that we probably should cherish is that we are adaptable and we are resilient. All of us, all of us Canadians are, we will get over this rough patch. We will. It's just going to take some time and some adaptation. And then the way forward is just easier. Thank you. Thank you for your willingness to help our community understand more and be a meaningful change, meaningful education, meaningful truth, meaningful reconciliation. You're very welcome. the day the black row came into his land they said we will teach your children right from wrong and they took him from his mother's hand he was gone could not sing He was told that it was a sin But sometimes he'd fly out on the eagle's wing In his mind Robbed of his spirit and his pride He was told his people were undignified He could not speak the language of his land How could a man like that survive? Now he drinks whiskey out in bars He says this fire water can do me no harm Can't you see he lost his soul years ago
I share with you the words of the Rosicrucian contribution to peace. And I invite you to take these words into your heart. I contribute to peace when I strive to express the best of myself in my contacts with others. I contribute to peace when I use my intelligence and my ability to serve the good. I contribute to peace when I feel compassion toward all of those who suffer. I contribute to peace when I look upon all as my brothers and sisters, regardless of race, culture, or religion. I contribute to peace when I rejoice over the happiness of others and pray for their well-being. I contribute to peace when I listen with tolerance to opinions that differ from mine or even oppose them. I contribute to peace when I resort to dialogue rather than force to settle any conflict. I contribute to peace when I respect nature and preserve it for generations to come. I contribute to peace when I do not seek to impose my conception of God upon others. I contribute to peace when I make peace the foundation of my ideals and philosophy. the Rosicrucian contribution to peace statement. And as we consider these ideas as contribution to peace, we move into a time of silence as we ask ourselves, each of us, how can I be a contribution to peace today? How can I be a contribution of peace today?
And as we end our time in the silence, we become aware of our breath again. We become aware of our thinking again. And we give thanks for this time of regeneration. We give thanks for this time of rest, for this time of reflection. And we go forward mindful, intentional, willing to contribute to peace, to be the presence of peace in our lives. and in the life of the world. And so it is. You are invited to join us on Thursdays for our weekly prayer and meditation service. Please note that our time is changing. Instead of 11 o'clock in the morning, the prayer service will now be at 4 o'clock, beginning on June the 17th, 4 o'clock. At the prayer service, we connect with each other. We check in with each other. We move into a time of prayer and meditation. We read the names of the people whose names are on our prayer list. It is a time of centering, a time of recharging, a time of re-energizing. I invite you to join us. No experience is necessary. Everything is guided. Four o'clock on Thursdays. And if you know anyone whose name you would like to see on that prayer list, or if you would like your name added to the prayer list, then please email us, unityofnewwestminster at gmail.com. And we will be sure to get the name that you need added to the list. With the lifting of restrictions, especially restrictions to do with religious gatherings, we are now in a position where we can welcome people back to our sanctuary. Starting on July the 18th and through the end of the summer, we will hold in-person services on the third and the first Sunday of the month. That means the 18th and then on August the 1st, and then August the 15th, and then again on September the 5th. So just know that you are welcome to attend. No registration is required. If you are double vaccinated, masks are no longer required. They are recommended and requested by us. Also recognize that at least until the end of the summer, the service will be a pre-recorded service. So come into the sanctuary, be part of the community, and the service itself will be screened from YouTube as it is being done right now as we speak. So excited though at the idea of being able to welcome everybody back and to see people's faces in person again. At the same time, 
know that the online service will continue and will continue even after we go completely live. We will always have an online uh, service celebration so that nobody is excluded from our message here at Unity of New Westminster. All are welcome. All are worthy. All are celebrated. There are many, many ways to give to our organization, either through credit card online or um, direct interact transfers or checks or cash. We are so grateful for the generosity of the contributions that we receive, which support not just our ministry, but also organizations in our own community that do amazing work and Unity Canada that spreads the message of unity across the country. Thank you for your contributions. I invite you now to hold whatever you feel blessed for in your hands, in your heart, financial, family, roof over your head, food on the table, just whatever you are feeling blessed with as we sing our blessing song. I am so grateful for all that I have. I am so blessed. I am so blessed. I am so grateful. I am so blessed. I am so blessed. I am so blessed. I am so grateful for all. I am the light of God, I am the love of God, 
I am the power of God. I am the presence of God. Wherever I am, God is. I am the light of God. I am 